Good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, thank you for coming this morning to worship with us. Uh, let's start this morning by standing together, singing of the awesome power of the one who saves us. burden of sin. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live and all to Jesus I surrender the 
morning. It's a joy to have you here today. I want to uh, publicly say thank you. We had a wedding here yesterday and uh, Springer's, Whitney Springer married Jarrett Thomas and they left the decorations. Uh, I think Ed, are Ed and Wendy here? Why aren't they here? <laughs> uh, Ed grew the pumpkins. They're amazing. So we appreciate them leaving their decorations for us to enjoy. God in the arts is this evening. That, as you look around the perimeter of the uh, room, you'll see some art, and that is in celebration of God as a creator, having made us in his image, and we use those gifts to glorify him, and that is the reason for these items surrounding us today, to the glory of God. Of God. This evening we'll be celebrating that especially at six o'clock. I would encourage you to come back. We have a very special speaker, Silas Montgomery. Uh, Silas is a, uh, a pastor from Cisna Park. Uh, he's an interesting man. Uh, he's Jewish. Uh, he loves Jesus. Uh, he loves art. And so he's going to be talking about at least two of those things this evening. <laughs> And I would encourage you to come and hear him. Child care is being provided for birth to three years of age. So don't let that stop you from coming. Uh, we will have uh, uh, um, Cindy Mott. Uh, we've asked her. She's baked uh, her delicious cupcakes that are in themselves a work of art. Uh, those will be provided this evening. So come should be a glorious evening. I need help, though. Everything's going to be happening in the lobby. So if someone could please help, we need 10 of the round white tables rolled to the lobby. So if you could help us immediately after this service, roll 10 round white tables to the lobby, and we'll put uh, uh, six chairs each around those tables of these chairs. We'd appreciate that very, very, very much. Rick Rhodes. It's time to get ready for Christmas choir. And I see a lot of faces <laughs> out there that have sung in the choir before, and I see a lot of faces out there of people that I've asked to sing in the choir. And it's, it's going to be a special year. We're only singing twice this year. 
So we're going to practice right after church starting on November the 6th. And we'll skip the 13th, so we'll do the 6th and the 20th. And we'll sing the first time the Sunday after Thanksgiving. And then the next time we will sing is December 18th, both of which are Sundays. And I'd really like to see some new members this year. It's not going to be music that you can't learn. It's going to be not easy music, but it won't be super difficult to where you can't stand by somebody and learn your part. So please join us November the 6th. That's in two weeks from today. We're going to meet in the church uh, in 208, 208 there in the corner. And we'll try to have everybody out of here by 1230 each day. So I'll probably be coming after some of you anyway. So <laughs> Good. Paul being chief of those. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Operation Christmas Child is a ministry in which we participate. I'm very grateful for the folks who have led that ministry and for you and the gifts that you have provided for that ministry. Uh, the Ladies Missionary Fellowship meets this Tuesday, and they will be packing boxes. So if you buy a bunch of matchbox cars, 40 or 50 or 60 or 100 of those, if you bring those, they can put them in the boxes. Uh, if you want to provide, uh, I don't know, 150 dolls, they can put those in the boxes. So they will be packing boxes on Tuesday. So you can bring your stuff and you can help pack the boxes as well. We have a work day on Saturday, October 29th from uh, 8 to noon. Outdoor work for the most part. That'd be awesome. And then a uh, ministry that we have to the community and to children of the community is going to be happening on October the 31st. That is the Hallelujah Party. Thank you so much for those of you who have signed up already. There are all kinds of sign-ups out there. There's a mother-daughter painting event that's being planned. That'd be awesome for you to come to. There's a sign-up out there for that. Check the sign-ups on the desk. There's much to be in prayer for. Just before we pray, there's much to be in prayer for. People who are recovering from illnesses, uh, people who are finding themselves in difficult days, things for which we can give thanks. Harrison, little baby Harrison, we prayed, prayed for him. He's here somewhere. He's there. Uh, and Mom, we prayed much for Harrison. How many weeks were you in the NICU unit? Two and a half. Two and a half. Two and a half years, it seems like, no doubt. Uh, so we're grateful for Harrison. Caleb, leaving for the Marines today. A uh, young man who's uh, been attending the church. So lots to pray for. Pray for one another uh, and lift up one another in prayer. In fact, let's pray right now, please. Do you just bow your heads? And our, our world is so noisy. So let's just embrace this moment don't let it make you nervous this moment of quiet and cry out to god for mercy and to make his presence known to us as we worship him just in these moments of quiet Heavenly Father, it is no cliche that you say to us, be still and know that you are God. We want to know you, the power of the resurrection, and the fellowship of your sufferings, to your name's honor and glory. Amen.
Please stand as we uh, join in the responsive reading. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participa participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we are our but we all partake. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and we had given thanks, he broke it, and then said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took a cup, and after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You may be seated. Our guest here today, uh, please uh, don't be nervous about the fact that we're about to be taking communion together as the body of Christ. Um, Communion is such a uh, worshipful and joyful and humbling uh, experience to share together as the body of Christ. And these elements are not ours. Uh, they were given to God's people by the Lord himself. And so uh, we practice here what we consider open communion so that those who are Christ, those who know him as their Savior, are invited to join with us, whether they're part of this particular local body of believers or not. But that doesn't mean the elements aren't significant. They are, because they represent, of what they represent. They represent the, the uh, death of the Lord Jesus Christ and his substitutionary atonement, that Jesus died in our place. He died for us. He took our sin upon himself. Uh, that there is no other way by which men and women can be made right with God 
than through what Jesus accomplished for us in his death and his burial and his resurrection. And so as we do take these elements, we do it in obedience to Christ. We do it as an act of love and celebration of our hope that we have in Christ. And we do it as the unified body of Christ. And we do it as a, as a means of proclaiming to the world the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection and our anticipation of the Lord's coming again. You do proclaim the Lord's death till he comes, and he shall come indeed. So if the men would come down that are going to help, please. As you receive the cup, uh, you will note that there you will be getting the cup and the bread together. If you would just uh, hang on to those until we can take those elements together, and you'll know when that time has come. Uh, Heavenly Father, again, we come into this time as an act of worship. We adore you, and we're grateful for the blood of Christ, that we've been purchased not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with the precious, precious, precious blood of our Lord and Savior. And uh, we partake of this, uh, these elements in obedience to you and out of deep and profound gratitude for your grace extended to us. May you be pleased by what we do and say uh, in these moments. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ooh. Mm -hmm.
Scripture says, on the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he told his disciples to take and eat it and to do so in remembrance of him. He also took the cup and said to drink it and to do so in remembrance of him. Let's sing one last chorus of thanksgiving together. Thank you, oh my situation, the heat shield, the angle of trajectory, and the typhoon. There's just so many variables. I'm a little I know what lost. the problems are, Henry. It could be the worst disaster NASA has ever experienced. With all due respect, sir, I believe this is going to be our finest hour. The clip is from uh, the movie Apollo 13. You've probably seen the movie. If you haven't seen the movie, you know the story uh, that as they are making their way to the moon uh, and stirred a cryo tank, that tank exploded, taking half of the spaceship with it. Uh, there was very, very real doubt as to whether or not uh, they would return uh, to the earth and through the grace of God and the ingenuity uh, of the uh, staff of NASA at that time, they were able to successfully return. We live in troublesome times. We mark those times. We are aware of those times. We watch the news. Uh, we are bothered by the things that we see and hear. We hear about the racial tension that exists now in the world in which we live. We hear all kinds of things about the election, and we're troubled about the sorts of things we're hearing and what we should do. There are global threats that concern us, ISIS, Russia, China, what is going to happen to the world and the future of it, especially given the fact that man has the ability to exterminate all other breathing human beings. We are seeing an erosion uh, of core beliefs and ethics we are witnessing the explosion of pornography and abortion and immorality and consumerism and pluralism and secularism. And we are tempted to cry out as the body of Christ, all is lost, icebergs dead ahead. It is time in the minds of many to head for the bunker, to pull back, to close ranks, to circle the wagons, to take a defensive posture, to wring our hands, to pray, Jesus, come and take us out of this mess. I'm not saying the church should not pray for revival. I'm not saying that difficult days are not upon us. They are upon us. I'm not saying that the struggle is not real or the opposition is not, uh, is imagined or the fact as a Pulitzer, recent Pulitzer Prize winner wrote, the times, they are changing. 
What I am saying, if you believe that God is on the throne, we've been looking at that through the book of Revelation, if you believe in calling, if you believe in spiritual enablement, then against the backdrop of these days, we could see and believe that the body of Christ may have its most significant ministry in the United States that it has ever had. In Acts 4, we read, Truly in this city, as they were gathered there praying together, the followers of Christ, Truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. But yet, they said, they were gathered there to do whatever your hand, God's hand, and your plan had pre destined to take place do we pray like the people in acts chapter number four do we lament the times but do we rejoice in the sovereign purposes of god in acts four it also says why did the gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain then we can pray grant to your servants this is Acts chapter 4. Grant your servants to continue to speak to the world your word with all boldness. I am submitting to you that as the body of Christ, this could be our finest hour. All this talk of the sovereignty of God is not theological mumbo-jumbo meant to fill up an hour's worth of worship. Or to simply pump us up. Pump you up. <laughs> How could it be our finest hour? Does it take the people of God to do the work of God? Certainly. God has in his wise sovereignty, uh, sovereignty entrusted his work to us. <laughs> and you can't help but think about Esther. I'm going to be going to the book of Esther for the month of month of November and then we're doing an Advent series out of the book of John and then if Jesus does not come back since the Cubs are in the World Series we will go back to Revelation you knew I had to say it right <laughs> had to get it over with but in the book of Esther her uncle tells us Xerxes <laughs> this powerful Sovereign despot is on the throne. This arrogant Persian king. But God is out to deliver his people. <laughs> How's he going to do that? Through Esther. For God has called you for such a time as this. So it required Esther's willing obedience to that call for God to fulfill his sovereign purposes. So indeed, it is through the likes of you that God will do it, but this could be our finest hour. In the midst of all the desperation, in the midst of all the hand-wringing, in the midst of all the fear-mongering, it could be the time for God's people to rise and stand and proclaim, this is the day of the Lord and there is hope in Him. How can we do that? How can we do that given the fact that we ourselves are facing such days of uncertainty? Well, look in your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Megan, I forgot to throw the receiver over the ledge. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about for this. Okay, you just do the clicking, sister, and we'll, you do a good job. That's it. Thank you. Let's see if it'll work. Troublesome times, troublesome times. We talked the last time we were in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 about the church being filled with the Spirit. And when the church is filled with the Spirit, we said 
It's going to be a place of transformation. And the greatest transformation is when we are led to know Christ by the Spirit as he makes the Word of God become alive to us and as he is involved in that, that amazing transformation that we call new birth and we move out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, that the greatest transformation is that transformation, that we are liberated from prison, that we are resurrected from death and brought into life, that transformation the Spirit participates in. And when the Spirit of God is free to do the work of God, He does that work of transformation. And it's a glorious thing to see. People enter into the kingdom. It's a glorious thing to see. There, it is a place of diversity, and we're going to talk more about that today. And it is a place of service. It is where God's people are ministering to the, each other. And not only are they ministering to each other, they're also going out into the community, into Sibley, and into Melvin, and to Fisher, and Champaign. And they are ministering to the communities in which God has called them a spirit-filled church. But today we're going to move just a little bit and we're going to think about what about a spirit-gifted church. I've been a believer long enough to remember going through the time in the 70s when knowing your spiritual gift became a huge thing. It was a big thing. There were all kinds of uh, tests being offered that you could take, and there were all kind of the Sunday school classes and discussions being had about what's your gift, are you operating in your gift, how do you discover your gift, all those things were being batted about and, and talked about and discussed, it was, and then it kind of quieted down, but now we've kind of moved back, what goes around, keep your ties, man, keep your ties, I have ties wide enough to cover up my whole front keep them they're coming back they're going to come back just a matter of time keep your ties i've still got a couple of pairs of bell bottoms i'm waiting for that day and so what goes around comes around and so we're once again seeing this movement to come back to talking about the gifts it is a good thing for us to do so this is the conclusion really of a sermon that was begun last week get off the bench Tim, Pastor Tim, Pastor Joseph did such a great job uh, unpackaging some glorious truths about that. Go back and listen to those messages. And then I started in chapter number 12 of 1 Corinthians, and uh, we are going to finish that chapter today, Lord willing. Remember as we read 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 that Paul is writing to this church in this very cosmopolitan city and they are uh, doing some things well, but they are doing some things not so well. And Paul is correcting them. He is informing them. They've written and asked about a lot of questions, a lot of, lot of things running through their minds. And Paul, when you read through the book, he, he, he jumps from one topic to the next to the next, everything from head coverings to Christians and prostitutes. Can a Christian uh, still involve themselves with temple prostitutes, talks about that, all kinds of things, Paul, food, what you eat, all those things. And uh, he is also offering a corrective. And chapters 12, 13, and 14 are correctives. He is correcting some things that they have gotten sideways on. One is a hyper uh, realized eschatology where they are acting like the kingdom has come and it has in Christ but they have confused the now and the not yet and they have brought the not yet from the future to the present so that they are believe that the not yet has now become the reality so there are all these things that we believe are yet to come victories and transformations when we will be what we shall be because we shall see him as it really is the glorification of God's people, the transformation, the completion of sanctification, the reality of the triumphant rule of Christ being demonstrated in very powerful and clear and obvious ways. They had grabbed some of that stuff and dragged it in their minds to their present circumstances. And Paul was trying to correct some of that thinking. And there was some confusion about the Spirit of God and the gifts of God and how those gifts function within the church of God. And they had particularly landed on one, the gift of tongues. In chapters 12, 13, and 14, Paul spends uh, a, a, an enormous amount of time focused on that particular gift, 
how they have taken that gift and shoved it to a, an elevation that Paul said was never intended to be placed in that particular elevation. And so he is trying to correct some of these things that are going on in this particular church. And in doing so, uh, he says some amazing things about the gifts or what Paul would describe the manifestations, as he calls them uh, in verse number 7, the manifestations of the Spirit of God. Paul nowhere defines the gifts of the Spirit, nor does Paul ever give us a complete list. If you look at the list that are provided in the New Testament, never does he give us this exhaustive list of uh, what uh, the gifts are. He does provide some lists, some uh, lists, some suggestions. But let me just give you a little bit of an idea of what the gifts are, and then we will move forward into the chapter. He does not define them, but he always makes sure that we understand that they are correlated, they are related to this relationship with Jesus, that they are about Jesus as who Jesus is, his salvation. Paul keeps bringing the Corinthians back. Paul is not beyond a little, um, and, and sometimes it's even more obvious in the Greek, Paul's not beyond a little um, harshness and even sarcasm in his writings to get his point across. And uh, he, he talks about their uh, thinking uh, they had all this wisdom, and Paul keeps bringing them back to Jesus and the cross and the resurrection and that is where the focus is. And when we think about the gifts, that's the way we need to think of them in terms of who Jesus is and what Jesus wants to do in and through us. That Jesus wants to use us uh, as his mouth, as his hands, as his feet, as his ears, as his eyes, as his heart. That through the, the filling of the Spirit, now Jesus manifests his presence through us. Not saying we become Jesus. I would never say that. But there's a sense in which Jesus does indeed demonstrate the reality of his grace through us. And there is no other plan. <laughs> there's not a backup. I love backups. I like options. I like to know. What's a backup? What are we going to do if this? Then what are we going to do? So I spend half my life worrying about things that never happen worrying, worrying about this, worrying about that. What's our backup? God has a singular plan to take you and to demonstrate through you his grace and mercy to a lost and dying world. That's it. There's nobody else going to come riding over the horizon. There's not, uh, not a, a group that's being held back and when things really get bad, they're going to show up. You're his plan. And he has gifted us and given us the spirit to be able to accomplish that plan. So the gifts are the means by which God glorifies Jesus and ministers through us to those around us in the name of Jesus. Now, it's my, my intent, I have no intent today of really uh, giving you five secrets to help you discover your spiritual gift. First of all, I don't think there are five secrets to help you discover your spiritual gift. I don't think there are those secrets. It makes for good books, makes for selling books, but I don't think it, there's actually these secrets out there. I don't think God plays hide-and-seek with us. When I grew up in Louisiana, out in very rural Louisiana, uh, it was a wonderful thing. We would play uh, 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 hide-and-seek a lot out in the country uh, with knives, and, uh, and capture the flag was also a popular game. We'd play way out in the dark and the night. I don't think God is hiding things from us and trying to keep us guessing and that sort of thing. I don't think it's uh, that you have to reach this certain level of spirituality and God gives you this secret knowledge that you might not otherwise have. If I were, if you were to come to me and sit in my office and say, I want to know how to get my uh, understand and know what my spiritual gift is, I would in turn ask you a question. What are you doing in expressing your love for Christ today? Well, I don't know. I, uh, I, uh, I bake 
cookies and take to the nursing home. Then keep baking cookies and take them to the nursing home. I play music. Then keep playing music to the glory of God. Uh, I teach a Sunday school class and praise God. I watch little children. Great. I share the gospel at work. Awesome. Keep doing that. Just keep loving Jesus and following Jesus and don't worry. Don't, don't be fearful. Don't be in bondage to fear that you're not functioning within your spiritual gift. Do what you do in love for Christ. It is enough. And I think uh, you can indeed be functioning in your spiritual gift. Well, let's look at what Paul says, because it does matter. In verse uh, number 12, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now, when we think about what Paul uh, is going to be saying to us, and we ask, how does the Spirit uh, gift us? Paul begins in verse number 12 by talking about, as uh, he's going to do m uh, more as he moves to this text, highlight, circle, underline uh, the word body. He repeats it over and over and over and over and over again in this text. And as he does so, as Paul begins it, he is talking about a human body, and he is addressing the situation, not of unity, although that is a big deal at Corinth. He, he writes them and says, you're fighting and fussing with one another. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Paul. I'm of Jesus. He says, stop it, and he dis discusses, confronts them with their need for unity, but what he really is driving at among the Corinthians was their need for diversity because they have so singularized, that's a word, they have so focused, they have been so captured by a single gift that they are trying to push everyone through the drinking straw. And Paul said, oh, no, 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 no. You need to understand the gifting of diversity. We're not trying for uniformity here. We are trying to discover how the Spirit grants diversity. And so he appeals to them and describes for them the human body. Just as the body, your body, is one body but has many members, there are all these parts that go into the body, so it is, and here uh, comes a surprise, so it is in verse number 12 at the end of the verse so it is how, what would you think Paul would say given the circumstances and if you've been listening and not thinking about the Cubs playing the Indians and and what you're going to do this afternoon what would you think the word would be that would appear there so it is with the so, so it is with the church or the body of Christ but instead Paul substitutes or places the word Christ there because he knows and he understands that ultimately it is this body of Christ that there is this spiritual unity, this spiritual union with Christ and his people and Paul knows that that ministry is ultimately in Christ, through Christ, by Christ, to the glory of Christ. And so we are placed by the Spirit into this one body, so it is with Christ. For, verse 13, one spirit, we're all. And then, I believe, Paul lifts out two metaphors. I don't think he's talking, he used the same word, baptizo, but he's not talking about water immersion in this context. I don't believe. Uh, I think he is using this word and the following word as metaphors. We are all baptized into one body. People ask me, do you believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Yes, I do. As Paul describes it in verse 13, we were all baptized into one body, a metaphor we'll talk about for a second, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. Baptized into the body, we are, there's this spiritual unity, and we don't think about enough, we don't talk about enough. There's this unity that we have as the body of Christ. We think of ourselves 
as individuals making our way to the kingdom and we have individually been born again and we are individually now making our way to the kingdom and we bump up against other Christians and and that's true to an extent but there's also this amazing spiritual unity that the Bible emphasizes so much that's why I do not believe you can be a solo brother or sister in Christ. You just can't do it. The New Testament doesn't recognize it. <laughs> you say, well, are you saying if you're a Christian, you got to go to church? Well, I'm not quite saying that, but I'm almost saying that. It's close. It's close, but not quite. So Paul says that this coming, this gifting of the Spirit comes, this gifting of the Spirit comes through this experience of being introduced to the Spirit of God himself who places us in the body of Christ. He says the same thing in Ephesians. In Christ you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Jesus, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. It is through this salvation we become the people of God. You're a chosen race, royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people, plural, for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of the one who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You were once not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So now the marker, think about it, think about it with me. The marker for Jews, there were some markers for Jewish people that identified them as God's people. Circumcision was a marker a means by which God identified his people. Remember, he gave it to Abraham. This is a means by which you are identified as my people. The ethical law and how they kept that law, how they obeyed the law, those were markers identifying them as these are my people. Now the marker for God's people is the fact that each one of you who know Jesus as your Savior have had the almost pulled a Joseph have had the Spirit of God come into your life and has indwelt you, has come into you, has been brought into you, has uh, has filled you, has made up his residence within you. So true is that that the Bible says if you do not have the Spirit, you are not the Lord's. Right? And so now, the means by which we receive this gifting, this ability to minister, this ability to be the hands of Jesus, the eyes of Jesus, the mouth of Jesus, the feet of Jesus, this gifting that the Spirit comes, comes through our being introduced to Christ by being born again, our transformation, our salvation, all those things all those things are the means by which gifting comes to us. It doesn't come through a secret service. It doesn't come through uh, some sort of uh, uh, weird or unusual way. It comes to us through the Spirit, and the Spirit comes to us through us having been born again. So we all have the Spirit if we know Christ, and we all have the gift that the Spirit brings with us uh, to us if we know Christ. So the beginning point is this point of knowing Christ as your Savior. And I don't mean coming to church. Uh, I don't mean being baptized. I don't mean being nice. I hope you do all those things if you haven't. I mean encountering the living Christ, crying out to Him for mercy, experiencing salvation and hope, from him by being born again. So at that point, we are brought into the body. At that point, we are given the gift of the Spirit of God to indwell us. Verse 14, Paul offers to us what helps us understand these spiritual gifts. So the gifts come when the Spirit comes, and the Spirit comes when we are born again. For the body, verse 14, does not consist of one member but of many. Again, I think Paul's using the physical body 
because now Paul's going to use this illustration, and this was a very common illustration for Paul's day. They usually used it of the body politic. Paul's using it for the church. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that should not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body as he created, made it, formed it, each one of them as he chose. If you were a single men member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So Paul offers an illustration. And again, his emphasis is on diversity, not unity. There, it, it comes out of unity. And so he talks about the body. There's uh, a human body, and a human body has parts that combine to make it a single entity. Now, the older you get, the more you may shed some of those parts. I've lost some parts. <laughs> I don't really want to lose any more, but I may. But we have these parts, fingers and toes and eyes and ears and nose and feet and hands, but they, while individual parts, they come together and make up this singularity or this body. So that Paul's point is that God in creating the human body arranged it so that each human body has its single entity, but it's made up of a variety of parts. Which when I, I was reading through that and reading through that, given my age, the first thing I, I thought about was Wendy's. Well, what's in this chicken sandwich? Well, you take a lot of chickens and assemble the respective parts. What parts? Different parts. As I hear tell, all the parts are crammed into one big part, and one big part is cut up into little parts because parts is parts. Don't you remember that commercial? Oh. Yes. It's historic. I think, it's, I think they show it at one of those museums in Washington, D.C. Parts is parts, and the body is made of these parts, skeleton and circulatory system and digestive system and all these systems that go into the parts. 100 trillion cells, I read. 650 muscles, 206 bones, 20 square feet of skin. You blink your eyes 6 million times a year just for a little trivia. All these parts, you got all these parts that are part of this body. And Paul gives this summary statement, and this is what he's trying to drive at in verse number 20. As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Don't have any spiritual pride about your part. <laughs> there are a lot of parts. And we all come as a part and are placed into the whole the body of Christ. That's just an illustration. That's all Paul is trying to, to press, just like Paul uh, does no different than we do today. Here is a window to let a little light in and a very theological idea. And the light is just think about your body. Your body has all these parts and yet is one. So the body of Christ has a lot of parts and yet it is one that is in Christ. And why is, are these gifts necessary? But the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And goes on and describes all these parts. Then he moves and shifts down in verse 21. The eye cannot say the hand to have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet to have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the great honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Again, he's talking about the body. He's trying to get them to see this need to understand this great diversity that is in the body. 
which our presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body that giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church apostles and prophets and teachers, miracles and healings and helping and administrating in various kinds of tongues or ways of speaking. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret and earnestly desire the higher gifts. It's a complex verse, notice number 31, especially given the reality that he has already expressed that God sovereignly places the gifts in the body as he chooses. Why do these gifts come to us? So you're beginning to, to see it. The Spirit comes, the Spirit brings the gifts. He gives the gifts of diversity to the body of Christ, just like your human body has all these parts, so the body of Christ has all these parts. To what end? Why? What does it look like? Well, Paul gives the specific reason. And Paul has already said, this is God's sovereign purposes as he does this. There's no room for pride. We all come into this thing, whether we are rich or poor, Jew or Gentile, men or women. Everybody gets into the body of Christ in the same way. I think every politician ought to be born out of the middle class and never have made more than uh, $65,000 their entire life. That's the way I think politicians ought to be. <laughs> I'm tired of politicians telling me about how we live and they live, and we live and they live, and we live and they live. Well, Paul says, that's all I'm going to say about that. There's only one way, one way to come into the body, one entrance way into the body, one means of coming into the body. And this is the same for all of us, whether we're black, white, whether we're born in India, whether we're born in Indiana, we all come into the body through Christ and this gifting. God is no respecter of persons. Praise be to his name. And he gifts each one of us individually as he will. And he gifts us so that we may be able, in verse number 25, to minister or to care for one another. No division in the body. We're not, we're not, uh, uh, we don't have a, uh, a scoreboard up talking about who's more important than someone else but so that we may simply minister to one another same care from one another within the body this sense of mutual help and encouragement and service within the body suffering with one another and rejoicing with one another so that ministry can happen I wish I wish the whole church could have been in our Sunday school class this morning in the back we're doing the class on a christian perspective on death and dying the teachers that we have had have been amazing they've been awesome today bonnie aarons came and talked about i asked her to do a very painful thing mary is going to do a painful thing next week i asked her bonnie come and talk about the death of your son and she did it was agonizing to hear. But it was glorious to hear because one of the things that Bonnie kept saying is, oh, how the body ministered to us. Wow, I mean, what stupendous ways. I was waiting for her to describe these enormous sacrificial acts in which the body ministered to her. And do you know one of the things that she highlighted and she mentioned it, 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 it mattered to her because she mentioned it at least three times. She said, people wrote us notes. Who would have thought taking five minutes and writing a note could minister to someone who was experiencing their deepest point of agony? That's the body ministering to one another. <laughs> That's what we want. That's what the Spirit wants loving one another and helping one another and encouraging one another and it does not have to be this glorious big thing remember Eleanor Worth I've talked about Eleanor because that 
I've been here 21 years, so you're bound to get some repeats. Eleanor Worth. Don't you ever remember the story about Eleanor and Lydia Heitman? Lydia was, I loved Lydia so much. She was a dear saint in the church from which we uh, came, and she was an eccentric, and I loved eccentric people, and she was eccentric. You never knew what you were going to get with Lydia, and I caught Eleanor Worth, literally caught her because she did not want me to see her because Lydia was deaf. I just simply walked into her house with my eyes closed because you never knew about Lydia. So when I would go to see Lydia, I never would knock, but I would go in with my eyes closed, screaming at the top of my lungs, and I walked in, and there's Eleanor kneeling in front of Lydia Heitman, clipping her toenails. The body of Christ ministering to one another. Spiritual gifts. It could be singing. It could be praying. Praise God for these dear folks. After this service, there will be people standing around with blue tags, and they have this gift of service and empathy, and they want to pray with you. They want to encourage you. They want to bless you. And so the gifts are given so that the body can function and ministry to itself and to the world outside of it. But Paul specifically mentions here caring for itself. And in doing so, God is glorified. And Paul is connect, correcting uh, their worship service that turned into a hoot nanny, and Paul's bringing them back from the edge and saying, look, you've got to get a grip. Everybody thinks you're, you've flipped out. Nobody understands what's going on. It's turned into something it never should have. So the gifts ought to function in such a way that God is glorified and God is honored. But especially so that the body, if we get off the bench and minister in the power of our gifts so that the body is ministered to. We tend, as American Christians, to see ourselves like this. I can never do this. I'm too claustrophobic. But a deep sea diver puts on this, and usually they were kind of yellow, gold-colored, this uniform, and he puts on this helmet and latches uh, it on. The helmets don't look like this anymore. I, I was on a plane with a young man who was a deep-sea diver, and he would not let go of that helmet, I guess because his life depended on it. They're, they're yellow. The one he had was yellow, and it looks almost like a, a, a space helmet now, not like this. But these divers go down, and they are they have their own life support system, and they could uh, be 10 of them down there, and they might as well be a million miles apart because they are operating as these separate entities functioning down under the surface of the water as these individuals uh, in their own little individual space. That is not us. This is us. We are in a submarine together. <laughs> Together, we're rubbing up against each other. We're passing each other as we go to the galley. We are, we are, we have this these narrow hallways, and we're we're in this thing together. We're in this thing together, and God wants to His gifts for us to serve and minister to one another, so the world may see the reality of the transformation of the power of the Spirit, folks. This could be our greatest hour. This is not the time for us to get nervous in the service. It's not the time for us to get hand-wringing and fearful and want to run and hide. And to, to I've, uh, I have shot, I, I'd hate to tell you how many I've shot in my lifetime. Forgive me if it offends you, but I have shot dozens, literally dozens of armadillos in my life. I used to love, my mother hated armadillos because they tore up her flower beds. So one of my missions as a young man growing up was to go out with a 22 rifle and a flashlight and exterminate armadillos. And I did it with delight. And so you, we want to roll up in that shell, you know, like armadillo, if you've ever seen one, they're a pretty ugly animal. You roll up in that shell and hide but this is not the time for us to hide. This is a time for boldness. This is a time for risk. This is a time for you to step forth and say, have you guys thought about doing this and ministering to our community? It is not the time for us to worry and to wring our hands and to worry about the future and what may happen to us. It is the time for boldness in Christ. It's time.
So let us be found faithful, and the only way it will happen to us is if we are empowered and filled by the Spirit. Let's pray. Would you stand with me, please? Oh, our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would fill us with your Spirit so that you can use us to your name's honor and glory. We pray that Jesus would use us. And we're always looking for the big things, and it's often in the little things. And we pray that you would help us be filled with your Spirit and yielded to your Spirit, and in the power of that yielding and obedience, be used in such a way to glorify you. Thank you for these folks. Dismiss them with your grace and mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.